right now I'm starting. Okay, sorry, just a second here. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, All right. then. Uh, hello, everyone. Sorry, let me just do a little quick introduction. So uh, today we have Bruno Braga from Virginia, and he's speaking on raw algebras. Uh, go ahead, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, first of all, well, thank you for the opportunity of speaking the seminar. I mean, 60 people almost here, so there's a chance this, okay, exactly 60 people now, 61 and counting, so there's a chance this is the largest audience I've spoken to. Yeah, so uh, what happens is a lot of people are arriving now, so in one of yeah, the yeah. Uh, And that, anyway, just uh, as everyone was doing before we started, I would like to take the chance to thank Buya Ming for this great idea. Uh, I don't know about everyone, but uh, for me, it's a great break from this pandemic thing to be able to remotely go back to university life once in a while. So that's a great thing. Okay, so now uh, let's jump into the talk. So first thing, uh, I would like to apologize for some technical uh, problems. I don't have any tablets, so this is gonna be a 100% slide talk. Uh, I don't have any better technology to do that. So I'm gonna be talking about uniform row algebras. Uh, but more specifically, this talk is going to be separate, uh, divided into two parts. In the first part, I want to talk about just classic uniform row algebras. So those are going to be uh, algebras of operators on little L2. And well, this is going to be a very biased overview in a sense that I'm going to talk about the questions that I'm more interested in and some results that I have with uh, several co-authors. But after I try to give a um, self-contained explanation of uh, row algebras and its properties and some of the main results uh, regarding rigidity. I want to move to talk about Bonnach versions of these row algebras. So instead of uh, CSR algebras of operators on lead row two, talk about operators on a Bonnach space with a basic sequence. I'm sorry, with a shoulder basis. Okay, so let's uh, move on. Okay, so first of all, this first half of the talk, so the L2 part of the talk pretty much, we'll have results with several different people. Um, so just to give extra credit here, let me just mention that those are Ilias Farah, uh, Yong Chuang Chong, Kang Li, and Alessandro Vignati. And okay, so la and combinations of those people. So now let's go to the, the, the talk. Okay, so uh, uniform row algebras, those are C star algebras uh, of uh, operators on little L2, and they capture some of the large scale geometry of the metric space. It will not really capture anything of the small scale, but capture some of the large scale geometry. And the questions that I'm more interested in is the relation between the large scale geometry of the metric space and the uniform row algebra. So how much of the properties are encoded there or how to classify a metric property in terms of C star algebraic property and things like this. So because of that, I want to start by just giving a very brief overview of course geometry. Uh, and then we can go to uniform row algebras. So in, if you have a map uh, between, if you have two maps between metric spaces, we are gonna say they are close if uh, they are uniformly close to each other in this sense. Okay, and most of the times this is going to be fine for us, uh, just as fine for us as it would be an equality of functions uh, in, in general. But in the coarse sense, this is good enough for us. And you say that a map is coarse if, so what this is saying is that you send bounded sets to bounded sets and you in a uniform way, right? So the uniform way, I mean, there is this assignment that for every R you can find this S and it doesn't depend on the points you're sending R close points to S close points. And the map is gonna be a coarse equivalence. So we don't care about the map being a bijection or injection or anything. We just want that the, the map is from X to Y and there is what is called a coarse inverse, a map from Y to X, such that once you compose them, maybe you don't get the identity, but you get something which is uniformly close to the identity in this sense mentioned over here. So uh, for people that are not very used to it, those maps don't need to be injective, don't need to be surjective, continuous, none of those, okay? So for example, some very simple examples, uh, all bounded metric spaces are coarsely equivalent to each other. 
Also, if you have uh, uh, Z, Z is coarsely equivalent to R, or more generally, if you just take a net in a metric space, and by a net, I mean a set which is epsilon dense and delta separated by some, for some epsilon and delta, uh, those are coarsely the same to us. And Okay, since we are in a Banach space crowd, let's just write a Banach space example here, but we're not gonna be looking at things like this in this talk. So this is very nice uh, result of Calton that says that for P in this range, you actually find spaces which are coarsely equivalent, but not isomorphic to each other. Okay, so what are the metric spaces that actually we will be looking at? So we are most interested in what I'm calling uniformly locally finite metric spaces, which for now on, I'm just gonna say ULF uh, for briefity. But those are uh, sometimes uh, defined in the literature as uh, spaces with bounded geometry. So what are those? Those are spaces that uh, the cardinality, so those, this bar denotes the cardinality of balls of finite radius is finite, but more than that, you have a, a bound for the number of elements in there that does not depend on the center, but only on the radius of this ball. <coughs> and the reason why we're gonna be focusing on those spaces is just because those are the spaces in which we have some nice positive results on it. So uh, if you are interested in examples of it, a very nice way to obtain examples is you look at a finitely generated group. Let's say that S is this finite set generating it. Uh, so you can construct the Cayley graph of this and you can endow the Cayley graph with the shortest path metric. And this becomes a uniformly locally finite metric space because this S is finite. Another very nice way for you to have some examples is let's say you start with a sequence of finite graphs and each one of those finite graphs, Xn's, they are K regular and this K does not depend on N. So you can glue all of them together. You look at the disjoint union of all those graphs and you put the following metric in it. Uh, on each one of the Xn's, just the same metric as you already had in the Xn, the, the, just the, the graph metric you had, the shortest pathic metric. And uh, for different elements here, you just want the distance to be increasing, increasing, increasing. So let's say you glue X1 here, so you take a big jump and you glue X2. And then you take a much bigger jump and you glue X3, and a much, much bigger jump and you glue X4, and so on. So those will be uniformly locally finite because of those big jumps and this fixed K that we have over here. So some embeddability results we have uh, which are known uh, for every uniformly locally finite metric space can be coarsely embedded into a reflexive space. Uh, and if you want to know the reflexive space, so what you have is given a uniformly locally finite metric space, you can find a sequence Pn with Pn converging to infinity, and this will uh, coarsely embed into the L2 sum of those LPNs. Oh, and I did not define what coarse embedding is, but that's just a coarse equivalence with a subset of it. Now, if you have something stronger, so if not only you have uniform locally finiteness, but you also have a finite asymptotic dimension, which I won't define what it is because, well, because of time, uh, but uh, you actually have that it coarsely embeds into the Hilbert space. And even more, uh, this property here, property A, is strictly weaker than finite asymptotic dimension and is already enough for you to have this course availability. So although I won't talk more about finite asymptotic dimension, I will talk more about property A. So if someone here doesn't know what it is, just bear with me for some slides. And I will give, uh, a, I won't give the original definition because we won't need it, but I will give something that is equivalent to it. So just, just wait a second and we're gonna give, uh, I'm going to give you what property A is precisely. And just to give a negative example, a negative result, uh, if you have a coarse union, so this is in the, the same as here, I'm looking at finite K regular graphs, I'm looking at this coarse union, but if those graphs are complicated enough so that they are what people call an expander, which is a technical thing, I won't say more about it, but then you can actually get that they can be complicated enough so that they don't embed into any LP. Okay, so now with this brief overview, let's just move on to uniform logics. And let's start with the classic literal two case. 
So let's fix a metric space and let's look at uh, the standard unit basis of literal two of X. So we're going to be thinking about operators on literal two of X as X by X matrices. Okay. So we just look at each one of the coordinates here. So if you're looking at this, you can say that an operator has propagation at most R. Let me actually just put the picture here. If it looks something like this, so this area uh, inside of this, those two lines, so this tube we have here is representing the points X, Y, uh, which have distance at most R from each other. And in here, you're allowed to have some arbitrary numbers, but outside, you must have zero. So this is a finite propagation operator. So they are also called band operators because they look like bands around the diagonal. And the uniform row algebra is just the closure of all such operators, the norm closure inside of uh, L of little l2. So this is what I have written here. So the uniform row algebra of X, which we call C star U of X, is the norm closure of all the finite propagation operators and those operators are just sometimes called, uh, sometimes called band dominated operators. So this is just for curiosity. Okay, so uh, some simple properties of these algebras that is good to have in mind since we're gonna be looking at them for the entire talk. So first, if you look at our old friend, uh, little l infinity, uh, you can uh, canonically identify this little l infinity even as an isometric uh, C star isomorphism uh, with the matrices which have zero everywhere except in the diagonal, right? I'm just multiplying coordinate wise an element of little l2. This is the operator that each element of little l infinity is representing here. And since those are just the diagonal matrices, the propagation is just zero. So little l infinity of X is contained in the uniform row algebra of X, regardless of the metric. And similarly, another, another space you have inside of, the, of every uniform row algebra is the compact operators. Because, well, the compact operators can be approximated by operators of this form here, right? I'm just looking at operators who support, and by support, I mean thinking about an X by X matrix, matrix the coordinates which are in zero, uh, operators uh, with finite support. We can approximate the compacts by that, uh, so again, regardless of the metric, we have all the compact operators. And just uh, one quick thing is, it is, in general, it's hard to, to give actually a concrete a description of the uniform row algebra. Uh, but, well, if the uniform row algebra is, if the space is finite, then it's very simple, right? If you have finitely many points in your space, every operator has finite propagation. So let's say that if you have n points in your space, the uniform row algebra would be just the n by n matrices. But if it's infinite, then it's very complicated, but in this case, it's still easy. So if you look at this space here, which another description uh, could be just, you're looking at the disjoint, the coarse disjoint union of singletons, right? The only thing we care here is that they are getting far and far from each other. Um, then every operator with finite propagation We'll look, as, uh, we'll look like you have some finite square in which you're allowed to have whatever you want, but after a while, the jumps you have between those elements will be high, bigger than the propagation. So this forces the operator to be just uh, happening on the diagonal. So you're just having the compacts, the C star algebra generated by the compacts and lead well infinity. Okay, now uh, rigidity questions. So as I mentioned in the beginning, the, the questions I am more interested at are the relation between the geometry and the algebras. So one of the, the questions here is, what is called the rigidity, is if you have an isomorphism between those algebras, does it follow that the spaces are coarsely equivalent to each other? Or even does it follow that spaces are bijectively coarsely equivalent to each other? So what do we know about that? Uh, so we know, for example, this thing here. So if you have uniformly locally finite metric spaces and you have this extra assumption, so you are only looking, for example, this couldn't be an expanded graph then. We are only looking at things which can be uh, put inside of literal two. Then uh, you have a positive answer for that. And just a quick comment here. 
uh, this geometric condition is not the best, uh, the best condition we have. We have strictly weaker conditions that would imply the same, but this is the easiest one to write, which is still uh, uh, general enough. Okay, the other conditions we have would be very technical and either have to do with bound counts conjecture or any, anyway, some sparse subspaces containing only ghost, ghost projections, ghost, uh, ghost, compact ghost projections, and it gets very technical. So let me just keep this simpler condition for this talk. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, anytime anyone is free to ask any questions, please. So if anyone is getting lost or has any questions, just please let me know. Oh, and in the, I, I can't see the chat. So if you can just say something would be better. But okay, so now uh, a word on the proof of that. And I'm gonna say a word on the proof of that because I'm going to come back to the proof when we go to the Banach space um, scenario. So if you have a bijective course equivalence between the spaces, so the, the word in my proof here is starting on the other way around, right? Instead of starting for with an isomorphism, I'm starting with a course equivalence, and even more, I'm starting with a bijective course equivalence. The reason being that if you just have a course equivalence, not necessarily you're going to recover an isomorphism, right? If you have a space with two points and a space with one point, the uniform rod of this guy is just the one by one matrices, while here is the two by two matrices. So you, you, you need to have a bijective course equivalence to guarantee uh, something more. So if you have a bijective course equivalence, you can look at this, um, this map here. It's just sending delta of x to delta of fx. And this gives us a very natural isomorphism between the uniform row algebras. And this very trivial property this isomorphism have, has is what I want to focus on because clearly this will be sent, oh, sorry, a word on this. This EXX is the matrix that is zero everywhere except in the XX coordinate in which is just one. And this map here sends this EXX exactly to EFXFX. So this is always one. Now, obviously that if you start with an arbitrary isomorphism, you should not expect that this happens. But the thing is that uh, in general, the geometric, some geometric conditions are strong enough to guarantee that this weak, version of this previous property happens. And this is what is going to be giving us a course equivalence. Because if this is bigger than zero, we are going to be defining a function f that for each x picks a y that realizes that this is bigger than, let's say, the given delta the, that this is bigger than. And this f is what, well, then you need to work on to show that this is actually a course equivalence. It's, it's not trivial at all, but this will be the, the map you, you, you want to show that is a course equivalence. Okay, now another word on some results on uh, the geometry of X and the uniform row algebra is the following. So if you look at the bijective course equivalences and you look at the close relation defined on them, this makes the space of bijective course equivalence a group uh, under composition. And the, the, the construction I just presented in the previous slide gives us a map from the bijection cover to course equivalence to the automorphisms of the uniform rod of X that actually passes through taking quotients. So you have this canonical map from the course bijective course equivalences uh, module closeness to the outer automorphisms of the uniform row algebra. And we can actually show that, at least in the case the space has property A, this is a group isomorphism. So for example, this would give us that the outer, so that all automorphisms of the C star U of N are inner. Uh, and just a word on this, uh, this, is, this is only gonna appear in this forthcoming paper here, but I would claim that this is a very simple consequence of a result of White and Willett that's why I'm, I'm saying that I'm putting their name here. Okay, so you also have this very nice um, relation between the geometry of X and the uniform algebra of X. And now just before I go to the Bonnach space thing, I want just to say a word on what is called the row algebra. So far we're looking at uniform row algebras, but there is something, a, a bigger algebra called row algebra, which is actually sometimes easier to work with, sometimes harder. But if you are interested in course equivalence and not bijective course equivalence, this is the right, um, the right, right space for you to look at. 
So what is the row algebra of a space? Let me, so I, this is just very brief, so I wasn't very precise here, but so instead of looking at the operators on L2 of X, we look now at operators on L2 of XH. So we have the L2 sum of, this is just L2, so L2. Uh, and if you take now the, so now the op, an operator here, this is an X by X matrix, but instead of having numbers in each one of the entries, we have operators on uh, Lira L2, right? And if you take the closure of all the finite propagation, you get the band dominated algebra of X. If you want to get the row algebra, you need to take the closure of the finite propagation operators such that each entry in this matrix is compact. That's what locally compactness means here. So you're looking at all the X by X matrices, uh, and here you have compact operators only, which have finite propagation, and you take the closure of those. <coughs> and the same kind of result holds. We still have that uh, coarse equivalence sorry, a coarse embendability would imply that an isomorphism gives us a coarse equivalence. And now you don't need to look at bijective coarse equivalence. Okay, this, this is, I'm not going to define those things properly because it's literally just a slide I wanna mention on row algebras, but you do have a canonical map from the coarse equivalences modulus closeness to the outer automorphisms of the row algebra uh, this is easy uh, to see that it is an injective homomorphism. So the hard part is to prove that it's surjective. And with the assumption of property A, you can actually get that this is indeed the case. Okay, so now that I uh, gave my bias overview of the classic uniform row algebra, let me move on to Banach spaces a little bit more. So first thing, uh, if you want to if you change the the L2 basis to something else, right? The most, the easiest and most natural thing to do is, well, let's just change P. So instead of P equal two, what if you're looking at an arbitrary P? So again, if you look at an operator on literal P of X, we are gonna be thinking about it as an X by X matrix. And you define propagation in exactly the same way. So those are just matrix with numbers there who support belongs to a tube around the diagonal. And well, the closure of all those operators is what is called the LP uniform row algebra of X. And this, this, those spaces, those algebras satisfy very similar properties as the uniform row algebra. So for example, for exactly the same reason I mentioned before, the little L infinity of X, those are, can be identified um, to the diagonal matrices. So you have discontainment regardless of the metric we have on X. If P is bigger than zero, the same justification I, I gave before works for discontainment here. The, the algebra would contain the compacts. If P equals one, however, this isn't the case, right? And let me just give the example here, but let me just say with words what this is saying. Uh, so the counterexample would be you just look at a matrix which has, let's say, zero everywhere except in one row. And in this row, you just put one, 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 right? You put this element here of L infinity. Uh, and this is what I'm doing here. I have this row, which is given by X, and I'm putting this F here, which is just one, 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 one. So this will be, um, well, a finite rank operator on uh, literal one. So a compact operator on literal one. But... If you have a, sp a metric space X, which is uniformly locally finite, and which is infinite as well, if this is finite, that's not, that's not interesting, but if it's an infinite metric space, which is uniformly locally finite, then this space, this operator can never be approximated by a finite, a finite propagation operator. Okay. Now, what can we say about rigidity of those spaces? So the first result on this uh, was by Chang and Lee, and it says that for P different than two, bijective coarse equivalence is actually the same as uh, the algebras being isometrically isomorphic as Banach algebras. And let me just uh, mention here, so the, the nice thing about this result is that in all the other results I mentioned before, you either had property A or you had coarse inventability into a Hubert space, so you had some extra geometric assumption for P different than two, this isn't the case. 
And the reason for that is just because if you look at a, a isometric isomorphism between those uniform row algebras, you can prove that this actually comes from um, as, uh, isometry between literal P of X and literal P, to P of Y. And those, if P is not two, they are very rigid, right? You just have some permutation of the basis, some change of signs. So the isometry is going to be pretty much giving you the bijective course equivalence you want. Now, if you want to remove this word here, if you just want to look at a uh, Banach algebra isomorphism, then we can still say something, but then we have again a metric property. And again, this is not the most general thing we have, that's just the easiest one to write. Uh, but then we still have something similar, at least in the presence of property A. A bijective course equivalence uh, would be the same as uh, an isomorphism as Banach algebras between the LP uniform row algebras. Okay, so now let's say that the L2 case was the classic, uh, this one is the semi-classic, but if you now wanna go to more general sequences, <coughs> sorry, if you wanna go to more general sequences, uh, what can we do here? So let's say you have a countable metric space, and why countable? Well, I'm, I'm going to be looking at sequences uh, as a basis, right? So I want to have this uh, parity, one element there is related to a nine dimension basis. So a countable uh, metric space. Uh, let's fix a Banach space with a shoulder basis. And okay, so first thing is, since the, we're looking at an arbitrary basis, we don't have that uh, things is one symmetric. So we should either enumerate X or just for simplicity, assume that X is just a natural number, so you have an enumeration already predefined. And for obvious reasons, we do the latter, it's just much simpler. Then you can define uh, the finite propagation of an operator in exactly the same way. We just look at the basis and the biorthogonal uh, uh, sequence of the basis here. And if the, this computation is zero outside of a tube around the diagonal, it, the, the operator is said to have finite propagation. And you can define the uniform row algebra of the pair. So this is representing the metric space and this is representing the, the basis of the, oh, sorry, of the Banach space. It's just the closure of all the finite propagation operators, which we are gonna be denoting B U D uh, cal E. Okay, so uh, let's see some very simple properties of, before we go to some rigidity uh, results, let's just start with the basics here. So how the basic, uh, the, the properties of the base reflect on the uniform row algebra. Uh, okay, so here I'm just saying the L infinities. If you think abstractly about L infinity as just the set, we have that this is inside of that, right? They, they actually define operators in there. But when are those guys operators, bounded operators on the uniform row algebras? Well, that's very simple to see that this, is, this happens exactly when the basis is unconditional, right? Because what you want for this to be in here, you want to have the projections on the elements on the basis to be bounded operators. So this happens exactly when the basis is unconditional. Now, the other property we have here of containment of compacts, uh, and this happens as well if P is bigger than one in the semi-classic case. So pretty much the example I gave to show that if P equals one, this wouldn't be the case, is the only thing that can happen. Because what we have is that your, the uniform row algebra will contain the compacts if and only if the basis is shrinking. Uh, and the proof is, pretty similar to that. The idea is the same, you just take the correct functional, which isn't approximated nicely there. Uh, another very nice property, which I didn't define, uh, I didn't mention before, but this is actually how many authors define uniform row algebras. So alternatively, you could define the classic uniform row algebra in the following way. Instead of looking at operators A on literal two with finite propagation and taking the closure, many authors just look at abstract infinite matrices with finite propagation uh, such that this value, so the supremum or those values is finite. And why do they do that? 
Uh, they do that because if you're looking at uniformly locally finite metrics, this is enough for you to have uh, that this matrix will induce an operator. Okay, so what this says is uh, once you fix a metric space, the the norm induced uh, the norm of the operator, which is induced by this infinite matrix, will be bounded by something that depends only on the propagation of the operator and the supreme norm of those entries here. So when is this the case? Uh, so for us, this is going to be the case. So here I'm just repeating this property. This is the same as this. And this happens when this metric symmetry happens. So we don't care about being symmetric exactly, but we need to have that for permutations which are close to the identity. So this is also called a partial translation because you don't want n to be brought to something much further than n, then those bases are equivalent to each other. And this I'm assuming on conditionality of the bases. Uh, okay, so now, okay, I just gave some very uh, simple examples, just very simple properties of the, the bases and the uniform algebras. But if you want to move now to uh, rigidity questions. So first, you shouldn't be naive enough that you would think that you're going to have a nice rigidity result for any basis, right? Because Banach spaces can be very nasty. So let me just present some very um, some pathological counterexamples, and then we're going to restrict ourselves to some nicer things. So for us to be able to obtain some positive results. So first thing, uh, rigidity fails very strongly. Um, Oh, just a quick comment here. If someone knows how to fix that, I would very much appreciate. I actually had a hard time trying to write a, a math frac in Beamer, and Beamer just, and it, it won. After an hour trying Beamer won, I gave up. Beamer always wins with me, at least. So uh, this is just arguers hate in space. Uh, and in this case, if you're looking at shrinking bases, uh, the complex will be contained in the uniform rule algebra. So you actually contain uh, all the operators, right? This is nothing more than all the operators in an arguers hayden space, so it's just the identity, multiples of the identity and the compacts. So it doesn't depend on the metric at all here. So this, this doesn't save absolutely any information about the metric you're choosing on your space. Uh, another question you can have is whether the Bonnach space here and the Bonnach space here must be related in some way. Uh, it must be isomorphic, let's say, for in order for the algebras to be isomorphic. Uh, so it depends on what you mean by an isomorphism in the algebra. But if you just want a Banach isomorphism, this doesn't need to be the case. So if you look now at bounded metrics on N, and by the way, this is very pathological in a sense, because if you're looking at coarse geometry, a bounded metric on N is not interesting at all. Uh, so this isn't an interesting example, <laughs> but if you look at a bounded metric on N, then, well, the uniform algebra would just be all the operators, right? Everything has finite propagation. So this is just the, all the operators in whatever Bonnach space you have, and so is this one. So since the bounded operators on little LP and the bounded operators on capital LP are isomorphic as Bonnach spaces, well, they would be isomorphic as well. So if you just care about an isomorphism as Bonnach space of the uniform algebra, then no. But if you're actually looking at a Bonnach algebra isomorphism, which would be more natural in this sense, then yes, they would have to be uh, isomorphic to each other. Okay, okay. let's uh, move on to some rigidity results. So first thing, before I go to just Banach algebra isomorphism, I'm gonna mention some isomorphisms which people don't consider in some notions of isomorphisms that people don't consider in the uniform algebra case which uh, has to do with preserving the order, which is given by the, the, the basis. <clears throat> so if you have a Banach space for basis, you can uh, give it a natural order uh, to it by just labeling a uh, an element as positive if each, re each representation as an infinite linear combination in terms of the basis uh, is in terms of positive coefficients. And you can say that an operator is positive if it's sending such elements to such elements. So you can talk about positive isomorphisms, uh, uh, order isomorphisms between those uniform algebras. 
and you can say the following. So let's fix two uniformly locally finite metrics and two bonnet spaces with two bases. So if you have this extra condition that the spaces are strictly convex and the bases are one symmetric, then if you look at a map, if, if there is, sorry, if there is a map between the uniform row algebras, which is simultaneously a bonnet space isometry and an order isometry, then you have a bijective course equivalence. And if you, now we don't need strictly convexity, strict convexity, but, and we just need symmetry here. Now, if you look at, if there is a map between them, which is, so we don't care about isomet isometry anymore. We just look at an isomorphism, but as Banach algebras and is an order isomorphism as well. Then you also have bijective course equivalence. Okay. So uh, in a sense here, you have something stronger than in the second item, right? Because you have this isometry here. But on the other hand, here you have a Bonnach algebra isomorphism, which you didn't have here. So those notions of isomorphisms are complementing each other in a sense. And you could ask, well, if you just look at the weaker of the properties here, right? So the weakest thing would be, you just look at a Bonnach space isomorphism uh, sorry, what am I? Uh, yes, a bonnet space isomorphism, which also preserves the, the norm, the, the order. Could we have uh, some uh, result like this as well? And the answer is no. So the question that I just asked is this one here. So if you, and I'm just asking this question in the simplest possible case. So if you have that those spaces are isomorphic as ordered Bonnach spaces, do we have that they are coarsely equivalent? The answer is no. Um, I won't give many reasons why the answer is no, but I can at least easily give you the example. So the example is very simple to construct. Uh, you just need to look at, this is an asterisk in the plane, right? You have here, you have the X axis, here you have the Y axis, and here you're just flipping it 45 degrees to have an X. So you have an asterisk in the plane. And you can construct an order preserving Bonnach isomorphism between this space and C star U of Z. Uh, and okay, uh, okay, just forget this one. I'm, I won't mention more about it. I don't think I will have much time to explain that. But, uh, and clearly those spaces are not coarsely equivalent. Okay. But one thing I don't know is, okay, so if you just demand a Bonnach space isomorphism, uh, sorry, uh, an isometry. If they are isometric as Bonnach spaces, is that enough? I have no idea. In the previous slide, I said that if it's isometry that also preserves the order, then sure, you have a bijective course equivalence. But if you're just looking at isometry, I, I, I have no idea. Okay, so now let's go to a Bonnach algebra isomorphism. So now we come back to that inf uh, soup equation that I had there. So let's say that you start with a Bonnach algebra uh, isomorphism between uniform row algebras, and you want to construct uh, a course equivalence between those spaces. So again, our strategy is to show that maybe if the space, the matrix satisfies some property, we can have the same thing here. So we can pick for every X, you're gonna pick some Y, realizing that this is uh, bounded uniformly uh, away from zero. So how do we do that? So first thing we do is to show that if you have actually this uh, isomorphism, uh, so this Bonnach algebra isomorphism, this is actually given by a Bonnach space isomorphism between E and X, E and F. And after that, let's negate this thing here. I will come back to step one, why this is important in just a second. But let's negate this. If this isn't the case, so you can find a sequence Xn, right, such that this will be going to zero. So you find the sequence Xn such that this will be going to zero regardless of the Y you choose. Uh, without loss of generality, it can be a distinct sequence. So what we do is we look at the sum of all those uh, matrices here. 
And just one comment here. So which uh, this is an infinite uh, sum, right? So what is the topology I'm looking here? So I'm looking at a strong operator topology, right? Obviously this will not converge uh, in norm, but I'm talking about once you plug a vector, you look at the convergence there. So now I'm assuming unconditionality for this to, to be in there, right? I'm looking at this is just, this is just the projection on these elements of the basis. Uh, so this is in the uniform row algebra because it has propagation zero. So you look at a uh, phi of this projection. And this is one of the important things of step one. Since the isomorphism is given like this, you can conclude that this is strongly continuous and you have that. Uh, and just let me come back to step one now. So this is a very strong property, but actually the very, the, there are two important things which play a very important role uh, on this, which is just this is strong continuity and the fact that it sends rank one operators to rank one. Actually, with those two properties, we can, we can forget about this U. Uh, but okay, so now we look at this P. Look at this P here. And uh, this P is just the sum of those Fs. And this Phi satisfies this. Okay, so now in the next slide, because of this, we can easily see that this will this set operator p satisfies this. So what am I saying? I'm saying that it doesn't matter how small I want my entries of the operator to be, as long as I forget finitely many uh, elements of my metric space, if I look outside of those finitely many, I can get that these entries are that small. And why is that good? So this is good because those operators are very well known, at least for uniform algebras, and those are the so-called ghost operators. So what we have is that this, um, this operator P we will obtain is a non-compact ghost. Uh, I, I wrote idempotent for us as a projection, right? In Banach space theory, we just call it a projection. Um, but anyway, in uniform algebra, you usually want P to be P star for you to call it a projection, which doesn't make sense in this sense. So you have this non-compact ghost projection here. And what is the problem with that? So the problem with that is that in, there are many geometric conditions that say that this cannot happen. So for example, uh, there is this nice result of Rowan Willett uh, that say, and by the way, when I mentioned before that if you don't know what property A is, I would give uh, equivalent characterization. This is what I was talking about. So this isn't the original definition. The original definition has only to do with metric, doesn't mention row algebra at all, um, but it is equivalent for uniformly locally finite metric spaces. So you could take it as the definition that a uh, space like that has property A if and only if all ghosts are compact. And the hard part is the reverse implication. The part that is done in this paper here is the reverse implication, the backwards implication. But more than that, actually, uh, we have a projection here, right? So we don't even need to look at all the ghosts. And this result here of Finsel says that, that if you are inside of Lidwell 2, then all ghosts, maybe, maybe you have ghosts which aren't compact, but at least all ghost projections will be compact, which would be already enough to give you a contradiction. So that infimum is bigger than zero, and you can pick the function that you have some hope uh, to be a coarse equivalence. Okay, so this then uh, translates now in our case, because obviously those problems, don't, those theorems don't apply to us uh, in the Banach space scenario, but this translates this, the problem of rigidity of uniform algebras for an arbitrary, not an arbitrary, but for some more general basic sequence to studying the ghosts in the uniform algebras. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, I have a question. So go for it. Uh, yeah. Uh, so if you go back to your previous slide, so do we know anything about the converse of uh, Finsel theorem? I don't know. Uh, sorry, let me think a little bit, but I don't know. Um, no, I, I, I don't know the answer for that. I don't know if this is none. What I do know is that sorry i could i couldn't hear anything someone is speaking and i, really? I don't 
Mute. Hello? Sorry, someone spoke something that I couldn't hear. No, it was, it was just an accident. I think it was speaking. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Um, sorry, what was I going to say? Okay, so I, I don't know actually if this is, if the converse holds or not, but what I can say is that for the goal of getting a contradiction, so for the goal of proving rigidity, this can be weakened. So for sure it wouldn't be equivalent because this can be weakened. Uh, what you need, you don't need not to have ghost projections which are uncompact. You just need to have ghost, you just need to, you just need certain subspaces of your metric space to have ghost, to, to, to have that all ghost projections are compact, uh, which are what we're calling sparse subspaces. But anyway, so for us to get a positive result for rigidity, you can weaken this, but if you're just interested in this, I, I don't know. Uh, okay, now, uh, so we need to look at the ghosts in this space. And let's, so let's talk a little bit about that. So for now on, let me just fix a one on conditional basis because I just, I'm going to use some terminology of Banach lattice. So if you look at an operator there, you call it as regular, if you can write it as the difference between positive operators and LRE denotes the set of all regular operators. And what you can see, what you can show is that, and this is very important, if you have uniform locally finiteness, then uh, every uh, finite propagation operator is regular. Okay, so the finite propagation operators are all contained in here. But this thing here, this is also a Banach space, but just not with the, the, the operator norm. You need to look at the R norm, which is given by this expression. So it, when we define the uniform row algebra, we look at all the finite propagation operators and you take the norm closure of it. But because of this, the finite propagation operators are contained in here. So you could take the norm closure uh, with respect to this norm. So you can define what I'm calling the regular uniform row algebra of the pair metric and basis uh, as the norm, the, sorry, the R norm closure of all the operators with finite propagation. So with this new object, so this is uh, inside of the uniform row algebra. Uh, so with this new, as a set, right, as a set, this is inside of the uniform row algebra. Uh, and with this new thing, what I can say is in the presence of property A, all ghosts which are in the regular uniform row algebra are compact. I don't know if all ghosts in the uniform row algebra are compact. I don't have a contraexample, but I can only prove that all ghosts in the regular uniform row algebra are compact. And with that, we can prove this uh, rigidity result, which is if you have uniformly locally finite uh, metrics, and now I'm looking only at one unconditional symmetric basis. In the presence of property A, a Banach algebra isomorphism, which fixes the regular uniform row algebra, implies that the spaces are coarsely equivalent. And now let me just mention some questions. So first, the main question to me, at least, that's the, the question I am more interested in, is just full rigidity. Do we have full rigidity in the L2 case? Uh, this is wide open. Now, more generally, for our case, right? So if you're looking at the Banach space case, let's say you have just a Banach space with a symmetric basis, uh, and you have an isomorphism as a Banach algebra, do we have this? I don't have a counterexample for that. Now, yeah, this is a, that's what I mentioned before, right? I know that all ghosts in the regular uniform row algebra are compact, but what about all ghosts in the uniform row algebra? I, I, I don't know if this is the case. So this, if this was the case, it would be very nice because you would be able to uh, remove this condition here from the theorem. Let me just come back there. Okay, now just uh, another uh, 
question. So if you are looking at this very specific space, Argus Hayden space, and you have a fixed uh, shrinking basis for your Agus Hayden space. Now, it, as I mentioned, this is always going to be just all the bounded operators, right? So it doesn't matter which metric you choose, you get the same space. So this set is actually just a singleton. And my question is, can you construct, do you have some different bonnet spaces of some different bases that you can get two spaces, three spaces, four spaces, and so on? So what are the possible cardinals that this set here, uh, the cardinality of the set here can be uh, once you choose a, a bonnet space and you choose uh, bases, what are the possibilities for that? So I don't know if maybe looking at the spaces uh, whose operators are just identity for single operators and things like this, you can maybe get some different uh, different uh, cardinality for that, but I don't know. And that's it. Thank you very much. All right, thank you uh, for a nice talk. Uh, so we can take questions or comments now. Any questions? I have a question, Braga. It's Christian. Hey, Christian. Hi. Uh, can you go back to 21, slide 21? Yes. Okay. So in the last theorem there, you have an isomorphism be be uh, between the uh, uniform uh, row algebras that maps this uh, uh, smaller subalgebra to the other. Yeah. Can you just, do you have to have that phi is defined on the bigger algebra or is it enough that you have an isomorphism between the smaller algebras? I think it's thing. enough to have between the small algebras. I, 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 yeah, I, I, maybe it's even written in the paper. Now I don't remember, but I think it's enough. But okay. I don't want to be 100% certain right now. But what? Well, I mean, then you can just drop a uh, like fee on the large algebra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think it's enough. I'm not 100%. I would have to check. Um, I would have to check because the norms there are different. Uh, that if you look at this thing here, you wouldn't be looking at the operator norm. You would look at the R norm. Mm -hmm. So I would have to check if there's no problem on, because then the isomorphism wouldn't be, You should if you want to write it, I don't want just a map between those two guys, which has the norm bound, right? It's, I would have to look at the R norm to have a Banach algebra isomorphism between those algebras as... Uh, and probably you'd, if it maps, if you have an isomorphism between these two algebras, I mean, it's got to be continuous in, mm -hmm. in, in whatever norm you put on it. So yeah. Probably automatic. Yeah, but I, I would have to check details for that. Okay. But I, I believe so. Okay, thank you. Fernando, go ahead. Okay, good morning, uh, good afternoon, actually. Hey. I, have a, I have a question. In the case P equals two, property A is a characterization of the nuclearity of the sister algebra. Mm -hmm. And um, my question is, in the Banach space scenario, it seems that property A plays a more secondary role, but do you have some kind of approximation property in the Banach space or Banach algebra scenario, if you assume property A. So some kind of factorization, some kind of finite. So kind um, of I, I don't have anything nice as what you're saying, uh, but in a, uh, maybe I can even, okay, wait, I, since I'm sharing my screen, <laughs> maybe I can even go to the paper and show you something there, which would be, because I, I don't have anything to write on. So I can at least, uh, wait I, just a second. I know. Uh, uh, sorry, where is this? Sorry, I'm not a big geek. Uh, okay, here. So let's see here, property A and goals. Uh, okay, so this is an equivalent definition of property A that I don't know if you're aware of, but it has to do with partitions of units of your metric mm -hmm. space. Uh, and what the reason why property A is used is to, ah, sorry, uh, where is this? is to get this uh, result here. So what you do get is a way to approximate in norm yeah. operators which are in the regular uh, uniform row algebra by those truncations here. Yeah, but this is a kind of, yeah, this is uh, so, similar yeah, to what you do in the nuclearity case. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, this is this is what I, 
what I have here. And it, it's in the archive if you want to see more details. I know this is just showing you a paper right now. It's, it's a lot of notation, but... No, 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 but I understand the truncations, yeah. Okay, okay. cool. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Niels, you can go ahead too. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for a very nice uh, talk. So this is Nils Larsen, in case you are not hey, familiar nice with me. Nice to um, So I have a suggestion for the very last question you uh, raised, um, cool. the one about the cardinality of the um, uh, set. Mm -hmm. This could be naive, this is not something I've ever thought about, but you know, I mean, there is, there's, there's not just uh, the Adjurus Hayden space. In fact, I think they um, construct a con continuum, or at least uncountably many uh, of them, that are what you could call um, uh, compactly incomparable, in that every operator between two distinct ones is um, compact. Mm -hmm. yep. And I wonder if you simply took the direct sum of two of those guys, that will have a shrinking basis. I wonder whether that might give you something oh, that's uh, nice, interesting yeah. here. No, thanks. That's, that's a nice suggestion. Okay. All right. I say this may be um, uh, not work at all, but I thought that might be something to uh, to. Start. No, no, no. That's, that's that's definitely a nice thing to look at. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, any others? Uh, for um, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the nice talk. No, thank uh, you. And uh, you mentioned about uh, asymptotic dimension, and just to recall, it's uh, a, a metric space has asymptotic dimension at most n if. Uh, the, for any uh, positive number r, there exists some subsets of the space such that the space equals their, the union of the elements of all those subsets and the distance between two elements of uh, those subsets is uh, greater than r and also the supremum of the diameter of uh, the elements of in each subset is finite. And uh, I was just wondering, uh, is there any uh, subclassification for the uh, for the metric spaces uh, with finite asymptotic dimensions, such that, for example, uh, metric spaces uh, with uh, asymptotic dimension zero are those uh, metric spaces with asymptotic dimension less than or equal to one are those, or less than or equal to uh, the dimension of the space are those, or when the asymptotic... Do, do, uh, yeah, I don't know, but are you interested in something to do with the uniform row algebra as well? Because there is one very nice result, result in terms of the uniform row algebra. It's not a classification, uh, but uh, it's actually, it's open, it's a classification or not. But there is a question on the, um, the uniform, sorry, the, the asymptotic dimension of the metric space and what is called the nuclear dimension of its uniform row algebra. So what is known is that the nuclear dimension of the uniform row algebra is at most the asymptotic dimension of the metric space. And it's known they are equal in some cases, a zero and one. They, because of some, well, zero obviously, because if you're smaller than or equal to zero and you're bigger than zero, you need to be zero. But the one, there is also a, an argument that you can get that if the asymptotic dimension is one, it, sorry, the asymptotic dimension is one, if and only if the nuclear dimension is one. Uh, but uh, besides those two, I don't know of any other, uh, other thing regarding the uniform row algebra. But yeah, it could be the case that they have finite asymptotic dimension if and only if the uniform row algebra uh, has finite nuclear dimension, but this is open and this, this is something that many people care about. This would be very nice if someone can get something like that. Yeah, and just uh, to make sure, you told that uniformly locally finite metric spaces uh, to, to be uniformly locally finite is the same as to be uh, to be of bounded geometry, correct? And then uh, yeah, that, if, uh, depending on the definition in the literature, but yes, it's it's very often in. Uh, geometric uh, geometric group theory referred to as uh, space having bounded geometry. And when we have uh, under this condition property A, the, does it follow that uh, uh, those metric spaces are uniformly or coarsely embedded into a Hilbert space? Yes, uh, this is this was done in the paper in which property A was introduced by you in I think 2000 or 2002, I never remember. Uh, and yes, uh, if you have property A, you automatically coarsely embeddable. You are automatically coarsely embeddable into literal two. 
And in this uh, occasion, the, I had a question. This property A is defined only for discrete metric spaces, correct? Or it has a wider uh, like uh, definition for metric spaces in general? You could even define for, I mean, it, it, it is a study, yes, it, it is a study more for those cases, that's what it is, but the definition in general you could, can apply to anything, and you can do it even outside of the scope of metric spaces, you can look at what is called coarse spaces, so you don't really need a metric, you just need subsets of x cross x, which will play the, the role of those tubes around the diagonal, so that's what the coarse space does. Uh, and you have a note, if, you, if you're interested in this, you could look at Rose's book. Uh, John Rose has a book called Lectures on Course. Oh, I don't know the name. <laughs> Maybe a large scale geometry or course geometry or something like that. And um, it does that in the very last chapter, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you. Welcome. All right, thank you so much. Uh, any others? All right, if not, thank you so much, Braga, for having a nice talk. Thank you guys for, for bearing uh, with me. Okay, so. Uh...